Lolita, I never told you that I've got a box of crowns. Is it? Is it another one? one? I've got a box of them. Wow. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a different crown for every day. It's oh, just wow. A... <laughs> that looks beautiful. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's Open Mic Foundation, Open Mic for Women. It's Women's Month today. And welcome. And thank you so much for joining. I am Seshni Naidu, the founder of Open Mic Foundation. And I would like to introduce to you Maura Glenny. She is the CEO and founder of Tears Foundation. Um, welcome, Maura. I'm so excited to be with everybody today and I'm hoping to get lots of questions and input from you. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to manage the, the, the Facebook stream and all the questions and stuff coming through. So I will communicate with you. So Maura is here not as the Tears Foundation um, founder or CEO. She's actually joining us today to share her personal story with us, um, which I'm so honored to, ha to have you on. And um, the topic today is get up, get dressed, put your crown on and show up. <laughs> I didn't manage to get my crown, Mara, so my <laughs> sincere apologies. So, so yeah, Mara, uh, I'm going to- One of my others. Oh, wow. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> so, so Mara, I'm going to start off by, you know, you introducing yourself and, and just get into your story. Sure. Um, so everybody, I'm Mara Glenny and I'm a survivor of interpersonal violence. Now, gender-based violence has over the uh, years become uh, segmented into different sections. But the bottom line is I was abused by my intimate partner and it nearly cost me my lives. So let me start off by saying many, most abused women are abused by somebody they know. It's not a stranger. So stranger danger is definitely not the big problem. Of course, there is the odd strange stranger that will, will hurt you or do something bad to you, but mostly it will be someone you know. But that intimate partner could be a mother, a father, a brother, a pastor, a teacher. So intimate partner means someone you know and you allow access to your life with. And that is always quite scary because you become you might be having dinner with him every day. You might go to church with him once a week, heading mm -hmm. a lift to school with him because taxi drivers are intimate partners uh, every day. So those are the kind of people that either will hurt you or rape you. And that's very difficult. So the first thing I say to people is if it doesn't feel right, especially for the younger uh, listeners, if it doesn't feel right, it is not right. So... You can't talk something right if it just gives you that feeling because we are all given intuition to know something is right or not right. And so if it's okay for your friend, it doesn't mean that it's okay for you. So mm -hmm. where that happens in circumstances, if I can just elaborate, because obviously that's what I do full time, I counsel yeah. women. If you're in a relationship and your partner wants to have a threesome, Mm -hmm. Honestly, that's a, that, that is really a highway to failure. And you don't feel right, but you don't want to lose him and you do it. That's, mm -hmm. that's intimate partner violence. And you can say no. If you don't feel like having sex and you're married and he continues, that's rape. It's intimate partner violence. I think we need to broaden our understanding of what mm -hmm. intimate partner violence is. It's very important. If it doesn't feel right for you, it's not right for you. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I stayed in a relationship too long. My partner was extremely possessive. He was extremely demanding. He was in the army. If, he did, if his clothes were not correctly um, laundered, he would just take his hand and sweep the entire uh, rail or shelf onto the floor. Sure. And uh, so I should have known then. But instead, mm. I taught my domestic worker to clean better and iron better and do those things. So what I've found is a lot of women take the responsibility for their abusive partner's bad behavior. And you can never be responsible for being raped or abused. Yes, um, I think that we are all parties of our healing and we're all parties of going forward. And so mm -hmm. I'm not saying there would be an innocent partner, but... 
you can, if your partner's abusive, it is not your responsibility to fix him. The very important part about life is he can only change if he decides to change. You cannot change him. That's very we, true. Very true. We stay in relationships because we think, you know, he's. We've seen it with Bill, Bill Clinton and Hillary. She spoke his adultery good by saying he'd had an unhappy childhood. He took advantage of a young intern, had sex with her, and then lied to the world. And unfortunately, that's a stereotype of what our intimate partners do, the role mm -hmm. models. And, and he didn't even get impeached for that. So I think we must remember that Hillary stuck up for Bill. Put that as an idea in your head. But Mara, I shouldn't have stuck up for my husband. I should have said yeah. what he's doing to me is not right. So how, perhaps you'd like how to... Do you, how do you know, Mara? I mean, how do you know when... You know, sometimes I think you love your partner and you want to give him the best or her the best. And you clearly want to do the best for yourself and for the marriage, you know, and for the family, right? How do you know it's enough? How do you know that that this is not the right behavior? Because some people, it, it's not hard. It's not easy. Firstly, to, con to tell yourself, firstly, it's not me, it's him, right? Yes. Women's instincts, it's always about, ah, oh, it's my fault. Or I am the one that's doing it wrong. Or maybe I should change and stuff. Because let's be honest, we all point the finger at ourselves first before we can point the our finger at someone else again. How do we know when it's, a, that's, it's not us? That's a very hard question because I stayed too long because of that and I nearly was killed. And I think that we share that. Um, yeah. and, so, and so we share it with many other women. That it's not just you and I, it's many other women. <laughs> and so I, th I think that um, it's one of my points that I love to share with people is that I'm blessed with a group of girlfriends that I trust. I would tell them anything. First of all, they wouldn't tell anybody. Secondly, they wouldn't judge me. And thirdly, they would support me. So I think we need to get support groups because women uh, don't always learn to have support groups. So when we end up um, in a bad situation, we don't have someone to bounce it off on. Couples counseling, not a good thing because you need someone who has your best interests at heart and then you can work forward. And if you want to go to couples counseling after your best interests have been covered, that's fine. But in my experience and in the recorded information that you can find from Dr. Google, mostly couples counseling, and in my case, that that happened, um, you end up with uh, incorrect balances and incorrect advice because we're all human. So you need to speak to somebody who has your best, best interests at heart. And I'm being very specific about that because I went also, I searched every, every aspect. And one of mm -hmm. the aspects I looked at was going to your pastor because that's what the Bible says. Uh, yep. take, and I've he heard that. Be, and he was too... <laughs> chicken I know I confronted him after I got well and I said you let me down and he apologized and said so but in the meanwhile he couldn't help me so pastors are not able to deal with that situation unless they have a special training on the trauma of gender-based violence or violence mm -hmm. in relationships or married don't go to your pastor because he can just pray for you at half past 12 last night I got a call from a young girl, girl who'd reported her incest abuse to a pastor and he said, come, let's pray. And, you know. Sure. <laughs> no, really? Yes, really. No. That's so, just so wrong. Yes, it is. But it's very hard to take a stand. It's very, very hard. So I'm urging pastors, and I do work with them, whether they're male or female, to take a stand and learn what to do because trauma unfortunately has to be dealt with in a specific way and I'm not saying an ungodly way what I'm saying is you can't just give a prayer personally my own view is you don't have to forgive your abuser you have to forgive yourself you have to find healing when you mm. have forgiven yourself when you have found healing if you want to forgive them then that's up to you mm. so wow. a lot of te teaching is about you have to forgive him why why a lot of things are all around that. 
Yes, mm. and actually, how could you possibly if you are still broken? If you are still, say, in my case, um, I had been so badly uh, uh, abused, I couldn't walk properly for six months. And, of course, it wasn't my body that was just hurt. I, I, I was emotionally shattered. And people don't understand. Um, they think that um, post-traumatic stress is for uh, Khan border to or the Vietnam vets. Post-traumatic mm -hmm. stress can happen after a murder car accident. It can happen after a divorce. And mostly it happens with, with violence in a relationship, rape or abuse. And so if you are feeling very depressed, very scared, in my case, I've, I, I couldn't park anymore. I'd lost the confidence of judging that space. I kept hitting the curb and I had to learn the skill over and then I got more cross on myself that because because I just I couldn't do it. So I wasn't going out of the house. Uh, as my confidence uh, decreased, I, my ta ability to do tasks uh, decreased. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I think that's a, how do we know? We know that's one of the things. We are monitored and our confidence is de de decreased. So if I'm speaking out to you today and you filing, finding that your relationship is making you less of a person than you were when you went into the relationship, something's not right in that relationship. Look for help. Yeah. We have Natasha that's on and, and, and a few comments coming from Natasha. Hi, Natasha. Welcome and thank you for joining today. So Natasha says that... Um, Great definition on inner, inner partner violence. I don't think we speak much about that. Gender-based violence is quite broad. But when you talk about inner partner violence, it, it is something that needs to be you know, talked about more. Um, another comment from Natasha says, as women, we need to learn to love ourselves first. We tend to make excuses for the behavior of others and put the needs of others before that of yours. And that's very true. You know. Women are the nurturers, you know, it's an it's a instinct that we are all um, given, born with, if you want to call it. And, and you know, first instinct as women is, is that we are nurturers and we never take care of ourselves. Um, the woman that I've come across, it's very hard to see and very rare to see. But if you ask a woman what makes you happy, they would never say themselves first. They will always say family or children or partner or parents or, or something like that but you would very really find that a woman actually puts themselves first and that's very true thank you so much for that Natasha um so tell me Mara how long were you in this relationship for 19 and a half years because I kept hoping he'd change but he was never going to change. So I was the one constantly making the adjustments. And for me, the final straw came. I was very successful in my business. I earned very well, so I didn't have to depend on him for finances. If I wanted a new car, I could get a new car. And so I was not dependent on him in that way. But what happened is he decided, uh, as often happens in abusive relationships, that he uh, and he started to have an affair. And um, he started uh, a, a second household almost. And he, he, his ideal would have been to go between both homes, which certainly wasn't my ideal. But wow. um, I was paying most of the bills. And so the crux had come when I said, um, the meal train is finished now. Uh, you, you know, I want to get divorced. Uh, and uh, you need to make a go of it on your own. And, of course, uh, he wasn't in a position to do that because I'd been the main breadwinner for so many years. And interestingly, I recently was on a talk show with a, a young, a, a dynamic woman in Israel who, whose, whose sister had been um, murdered, and she referred me to some very, very interesting research. And the research... Mm was that never, ever end a relationship on your own if you're in an abusive relationship. And it was interesting for me because I knew it to be true, but I'd never been counseling that to people. And because the reason research... again, Mark. Say that again for me. So I ended my relationship with my partner or tried to um, alone with him. 
And they actually say from the research that she's uncovered that yeah. when most most attacks happen. So make sure you have your mother, your sister, your someone at home with you, even if they're not in the room, but you've got a backup. Okay, um, okay. Because hmm. she relates the story that she would have saved her sister's life. Her sister was murdered. Um, if she'd uh, um, had a person there because he took out a knife and um, – and I think that's a common thing. And suddenly I thought, okay, great. All these interactions that we have with one with other women, we all add to our learning curve. So call call in support if you're going to break it off because you're not just going to do it in a moment. A break or an ending of a relationship has to be, to some extent, premeditated. You have to collect your documents. You have to know where you're going to live. Or even if you don't know um, where you're going to live, who you're going to call to help you. So, you, so yeah. it's a, a pre meditated to, to a part so I always suggest that in, unless your life is in danger and you can look on our website we mm. have an action plan of all the items you should collect and and now I'm going to add to it if you're going to break it off with an, a, a very jealous partner make sure you've you've got your back covered mm. it makes a lot of sense though right especially if you put in arms danger as well um, you don't know what the reaction would be. Um, I think in your case, you know, um, your partner at that point in time had an existing or was in another relationship. So he hopped over. I'm assuming that he hopped over. <laughs> How yes. is your relationship? Are, are you in contact with him? Are you, do you have a relationship with him? Um, you know, I, I, I know this is going to sound very hard. But he really hurt me so badly, physically and emotionally, that which is which is um, when I ended the, the relationship and went for divorce, I stood in the court, and I said to the judge, um, "The judge said reason for divorce." I said, "I want it listed as adultery and abuse," mm -hmm. and the judge said, "The laws have changed. You just have to say breakdown." I said, "No, I want it on record." Mm -hmm. And uh, and he, the, you know I was the only person on, on a, in a full role that said that, and and I do think that we should be saying why why we're getting divorced because it it makes it a little bit too easy for them that irreconcilable differences. No, he had an affair mm. and he hit me, and so the, the, for me that's a very uh, important uh, aspect for it. So the answer to your question is. No, I don't have a relationship with him because he was a bad person and someone took his life. And I'm grateful every day, not that he's dead. I didn't wish him dead. I just wished him out of my life. But I am grateful every day that I don't have to face him maybe coming up to me in a store and, and having to be. Yeah. Uh, uh, if I did meet his partner, his new partner, and she came mm -hmm. up to me in a store one and said, hello, how are you doing? And I I was so proud of myself. I just looked at her and in a monotone, I said, I don't want to speak to you. And I just walked on and I knew then I was okay, but it is a very hard, the question you said, most people do have to face that. And especially if you share children, it's very, very difficult. Yeah, very, very difficult. I think a lot of people don't know, a lot of women don't know how to deal with it. And you know, one of the things that I've uncovered, I think, over the last maybe two years, maybe three years going, Amara, is the narcissistic behavior, right? Narcissistic behavior, we're very oblivious to what's in front of us until somebody shows it or points it out to you. Um, exactly. And when you share a child or even a dog or a bird, because we become attached to them, and that's not a stupid comment that I'm making to uh, to someone who hasn't loved an animal, animal it might mm. be. And so it's very, very difficult to handle it. And so one has to learn. So so firstly, back to something we were speaking about earlier and then, then mm. on to this point. The one is, as women, we are givers. And I love the, the meme that goes around on the Facebook now that says, you cannot pour from an empty cup. So to every lady, I want to say, we do give, we do forgive, make sure that you go and do something. Even if you if you can't afford to go for a manicure, get a girlfriend over and do one another's toenails. Just do something a little bit for yourself. It doesn't have to cost money. 
because I was a person who gave everything I had and never spent time on myself. And I do that now. And so I want to share a happy story. I, I, a girlfriend shared with me last night. So my partner uh, of 10 years, uh, I've uh, got him into having a little sorbet man's treatment. And, <laughs> uh, and she then took her very much a site manager part of my husband on it and he loved it so it's not just us that need the nurturing it's our partners as well and it's about getting that balance when do you go uh, off or maybe book your nurturing together at a place where you can both go so that it doesn't become a secret indulgence it becomes a shared lovely moment so that that's that's very difficult and I forgot your question sorry <laughs> No, it's fine. Natasha says, oh, yes, that's something important, narcissistic behavior and verbal abuse. You know, it's, it's you know, narcissistic. A lot of women are not aware of narcissistic behavior. Oh, yes. So I do remember now. Thank you. So <laughs> make, make a plan for when you're meeting your partner because you, suddenly you see how narcissistic they are and how badly they did treat you. Cause we make those allowances, he's rude to you. I came from two relations where people shouted at me and I realized with hindsight that I was in a house where my father shouted all the time. So when I went into relationships where people shouted at me and were rude and I wasn't good enough, well, that was just how it was. And in fact, I would never put up with that now. So look at what the real norms are, not your norms, what you, you've learned to accept. So set barriers in the same way as I said, I've come to understand that don't you don't end a relationship on your own. In the same way, if your interactions are unpleasant, start to feel how would it be for you. So in the same way as children have supervised visits with their parents if you're unhappy with your father's uh, with your husband's the father of the child's new partner you can ask for supervised visits um it's very important i think to get a parenting plan if you own if you have children write down what the terms are a lot of people don't know you 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 can write out a, a parenting plan and have it lodged and be signed it doesn't have to be an acrimonious thing you have the child every friday and it's from this time to this time and you collect him and we meet at the wimpy because mm. i think to make get get work out your parenting plan for interactions with him or, or her, and 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 so I'm I'm really urging everybody to to get a parenting plan so that narcissistic situation is reduced, because yeah. sometimes we don't realize we can plan against it. Yeah, I think people because people are not aware of it what a narcissistic behavior is, they don't look for the signs until someone points it out to them, like because I've had a partner like that as well. And if I go out and I see a friend's, you know, it doesn't matter who it is, you know, treating someone like that, it, it makes you think, you know, people are not aware of the signs. They're not aware of what to look for. So they're very blinded because people are, you know, there's some people that, that looks for love, that looks for attention, that nurturing and, and we'll see past that. But if someone from the outside comes in and looks at what's going on, the behavior of a narcissist is, is so strong and, and, and so controlling that people, you know, they're oblivious of it, you know. Um, and I feel women should be more wary of the type of relationships that they get into because of recent as well, um, it's also women that are narcissistic as well right? So Absolutely. if you are not willing to understand what those type of behaviors are, you're going to portray that to, to anybody, even if you have kids as well, right? They're going to learn of, of, of those type of behaviors as well. So, you know, with, with living with a narcissist is not easy because it's about them. It's about them themselves, what they want, what they need, um, what do they think is best, what it, it's, it's a different ball game. It's never about you. So it is quite, quite daunting. And if somebody doesn't see that, it's sad. Um, hence why I'm saying there needs to be more awareness around these type of, of things and support as well. To your point earlier, Mara, the support that women needs to overcome some of these things is the biggest challenge 
because they don't have, who do they go to? And also the other thing is, um, I, I, I must say that uh, I, I try to um, put my comments in a constructive way, but we tend to, to not, and sometimes it's not easy, we tend not to tell the truth. So when we see a guy treating his uh, partner and vice versa, a girl, um, a woman, as you correctly said, it is also a woman, uh, is, uh, doing something that's unacceptable. We go, we'll quietly roll our eyes and say, oh gosh, I'm so glad my partner's not doing that. But instead, what I try to do, and I don't always get it right because I'm a bit too outspoken, but I will say to her, gosh, I was a bit shocked that your husband said that. Does he always do that? Uh, you know, <laughs> so I that see she becomes aware. aware of it. But then yeah. quite often yeah. she's cross with me. So so you do you do lose friends on the way as well for being outspoken. But our problem is that we are a society that keeps quiet in the face of abuse. It's we it's do. very hard. You know, last we night um, we um, we were on our way back from having an, a meal out. And a young lady uh, uh, on a Holly Davidson fell off her bike. And she was in the extreme left lane and we were in the extreme right-hand lane. And in that minute, you have to make a decision. Am I going to stop? It's dark. I've got 30 minutes to curfew. Um, blah, 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 whatever your decisions are. Am I going to stop my life, turn around and help this girl? Or will I go home and hope she gets home safe? And I think abuse is like that for everybody. We have to make that decision. Will I stop, turn around and try and help my friend? So the other way of telling people is to tell an anecdote. You know, I used to be in a relationship or my best friend is this or my mother did this. And and I and, and it must be pretty hard for you. I admire you for standing up for it. Um, how do you cope? Give her a way to talk about it. It isn't easy. They don't love you for it. They don't always respect your intervention till with hindsight. They see that you help them, but let's start talking about it. Let's embrace it. I do do it. I'll ask people straight out. You know, mm. I've, ha I've had occasion where I've had three beautiful women working for me and I've immediately after, uh, immediately, like uh, after a week or two, seen that they have alcoholic problems. And, and I, I remember saying to my secretary, Charlene, whom we've had the pleasure of speaking to, please call her into the room and ask her if she's an alcoholic. And she answered me this question. But Mara, I fetch her every single day because I was giving her a lift to work and back. And I've never, ever smelt anything on her. I said, yes, but I can see her behavior. And as Charlene sat her down, she said, yes, I am. And so it taught Charlene a lesson and me that, Maybe I should have spoken up earlier. And then we mm. said we'd help her. But we need to we need to know certain patterns because an alcoholic person does this generally. A drug addict does this generally. A narcissist mm. does this generally. They put you down. If every interaction you're having with your partner makes you feel unworthy, that is not the kind of relationship you, you should be having. And you need to find out why am I feeling unworthy? What am I overlooking? What is he saying? So self-analysis for me forms a very big part of living a successful life that is, that's healed. And healing is something you embrace daily. Because we're all human and we all make mistakes. Yeah. Mara, what do you think, besides which I think I do know, I mean, why do you think women don't step forward in this? Do you think, obviously there's fear, right? Fear in leaving and fear in why would, he, you know, why, what he would do to the person, right? Definitely for sure. What do you think is the biggest reason why the women don't leave them? So they... Um, worldwide, there's been a lot of research on why women don't uh, leave their abusive partners. So that's yeah. an absolutely great and very, very valid question. And the, the, the figure is that women try eight times, uh, sorry, I apologize, nine times to leave, mostly leaving on eight or nine, um, simply because a lot of times you decide to leave in anger rather than in a planned way. I just cannot take up with this another day. I'm going to leave him. You tell all your friends I'm leaving him today and he brings you roses and you forgive him. 
because you see those kind of outward uh, gestures are very nice to have but what you have to have is changed behavior so women don't leave number one uh, because they're ever hopeful that the relationship will be mended by their love the other thing is that um, we have a lot of traditions that involve going into a relationship so let's talk about uh, 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 that one of the things is we take their name we're not Mara Glennie anymore we Mrs. ABC so our whole life becomes and we are Johnny's mother and we are so and so's wife and so and all of those things are not bad but if they are your only form of self-identity they will hinder you from ever leaving so I'm saying you need to be a person in your own right you need to have hobbies and uh, things that you do that please you so you need to also be a full person standing in your own. So I'm Mara, who also has a partner. I'm not Mara, the partner of. And that is very, very hard because as girls, we brought up uh, into that role. One day you'll be married and you'll have this beautiful wedding, uh, etc. <laughs> <laughs> And, 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 and so it's about reconditioning people. The other reason why people don't leave is that where do you go? Who do you phone to fetch you? Where do you go? Because the shelters in our country, I'm afraid to say, are extremely, extremely poor. I worked in a shelter for a while. Oh, my gosh, before I send someone to a shelter, I have to know that their, their life is in threat. And I have to know they have a plan after the shelter. So if they're not economically active, how can they possibly ever leave the shelter and start over? So the next thing is you really, really, really need to be able to have something you can do that can generate income. It could be knitting. It could be sewing. It could be working as a career. It doesn't matter what it is. Baking. I, I'm, no task is too big or too small. Uh, as women, I believe we can do everything from the highest job in the country. Uh, look at the countries that have got women prime ministers or presidents. So, But we need to start knowing that we need to be a woman on our own and we need to develop our skills, even if it is doing an online typing course so that if you ever had to leave, you could type labels because mm. I've done a lot of jobs in my life. So we it, we hamper ourselves from being able to leave by our decisions and by the decisions that society makes for us. You know, Mara, you know, as I'm hearing what you're saying and, and wise words, wise, wise words, and I can definitely resonate with a lot of things that you're saying, you know, you know, for me, it's that how do we change this, right? How do we how do we change for the people to, you know, to to be heard, to speak out more? Because it's not okay, right? It's it's really it's not okay. No person has the right to harm another person. It's it's you know it's it's not right to do that. Nobody has whether you are married, whether you're in a relationship. No person has the right to harm another human being. There's and you found work, workplace, workplace abuse also is in, increasing. Yep. So yep. it could be at home, at work, at school, yes. because bullying is the, all of So it's, it's right across. So, so one of the things that I, I do believe is that we have to teach our, learn to uh, teach our girl and boy children to engage in a different way. So, for example, I had the discussion with, with Charlene, my assistant, uh, about a year ago uh, and said I, I think you should take this afternoon off and you, you need to go to a movie with your son and she said what on earth for I said well we work in abuse and he needs to know what it is to date his mom because that's where he's going to learn mm. how to date a girl so that's what she did she went out with him and it, it was a wonderful experience for them both that they will continue after the lockdown because they developed their own because he does boy things with his dad but he did girl things in a different way they went to a movie and they went to a restaurant and she taught him to pull the chair out and so where do we learn those things and it's in the same way that a girl should be going out with her dad she should be mm. going to, so they say that if a girl gets her first flowers her first perfume 
and I say they say because obviously life can be different for everybody, but then she'll know that um, getting a bunch of flowers or a bottle of perfume or being told you look beautiful or taken out to dinner doesn't mean you have to sleep with me or give me oral sex or whatever because those are the facts of life. We, d mm. we don't have unconditional love. So we need to teach our children unconditional love by showing it to them. The next thing is, I think, stereotype type of person because – when you're born, the very first thing they say, is it a girl or boy? And then we give a whole range of blue clothes or pink clothes. So we're really stereotyping that 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 child. So I've got a, a, a friend whose who's, um, daughter had a little boy. And, and um, there's not one blue thing in his outfit. There's also not one pink thing in his outfit. But she just, <laughs> <laughs> she gave him... Uh, dark denim, greys, beiges, and I mean, he looks beautiful, but she didn't want to stereotype him, type him for, for lots, of, lots of reasons. So I think with the clothes stereotype, my favorite color is pink or blue or green or whatever, we also say, well, you go and play soccer with your dad and uh, you come and bake with me. Actually, yeah. the boy, we, you know, so boys need to learn to do the dishes Girls need to sweep the garden. We need to have a, a chore is a chore suitable for a child. And so it begins all with how we treat our children and how we were treated as children. And often we have to relearn what we were taught that we do automatically. Yeah, that's, that's something that's really, really, parents really need to think about how the type of behavior you're demonstrating in front of your child the type of behavior that you are demonstrating with the child, your interactions with children and with adults because they see and they hear and they sense and they feel, right? So people are not wary of, of that. And they, you know, you also have a lot of kids that, I mean, bullying at school, when kids bully another kid, it always has to do with what's actually happening at home. Yes. Right? Um, it's the same at the workplace. I mean, I'm, I manage... Um, or I lead multiple teams as well in the corporate world. And you find a lot of, lot of stuff happens where people are unsettled at home. There's someone that's there that's unsettling with them. Um, I make it a point to always understand my, the people that's with me is that, how are you? Where are you at today? So that I can understand in order to help them to cope for the day, because as much as we don't want to admit this, right? We all have our challenges, not with ourselves, but more often than more often than actually spoken about, it's more with other people than anything else. Society has changed the way we see. We are so judgmental, hey. The today's society is so judgmental. So judgmental in what I say, in what I do, in where I go, how I dress, how I look. It's, it's just, and, and, and to teach children that, it's not. And that's where the change needs to come from a society perspective. It's just that, are people conscious about this? Are they conscious about this, Mara? You know, I don't think that they are conscious about it. Yeah. Because uh, what we all, always forget in society, besides those things, is how, how class structured we are because yes. you wouldn't see a manager in a company sitting with a cleaner for coffee and I'm not commenting on whether that's right or wrong because mm -hmm. of many reasons but if you were, knew what that cleaner was feeling then you would be more empathetic so I think we fail to reach out so interesting that you brought up bullying in um, schools that is actually the door to gender-based violence yeah. Uh, the biggest door, and it's the door to rape. So bullying is a huge problem, and it needs to be very controlled. So what happens is if a little girl comes and says, Johnny keeps pulling my pigtails, they say, don't be a tittle tail tit. Don't tell tales on Johnny or whatever. So you need to put a mechanism in. What it is for that classroom, I don't know. It depends on where they live and what their backgrounds are. But they need to have a place to be able to speak out where their complaint is is acknowledged mm. uh, and uh, acted upon in the same way as I found to my horror and shock as we sit here to date is even a fact that most 
play most big corporates do not have gender based violence plans yes. within their workforce and so what that means isn't that there isn't a plan it's worse than that it means the company has never thought through if this is brought to our attention what will the procedures be so when it happens people don't know what to do and even though you hope it never happens you need to know that it goes to this place and that place and this place because people get sexually harassed in the workplace make a complaint and sometimes it goes to personnel or to their line manager and the next minute they dismissed for some unrelative unrelated a project like tardiness and forewarnings or whatever the rule is. And so mm. people don't want to deal with it. So one has to have that written up and it's a huge big thing. So I guess what I'm saying is you need it at school and in the workplace. Yeah, I think wherever we go, we need it. And for me, it's about that conscious understanding of the actions that we do, the things that we say, how does it impact the other human being on the other side? I think a lot of things are not, con we're not consciously aware of our, of our surroundings and what we do and say. Um, one of the things that I plan to do, um, hopefully in the new year, is I plan to go to corporates and bring out conscious tr leadership training. So conscious leadership training is, is certainly needed. Leave alone you as a leader, but definitely something in the sense of, from a conscious perspective, how do you lead your teams and how are you aware of the environment and the surroundings around you? Conscious, so, so if something COVID has taught us, Mara, is to be more conscious around ourselves, right? And I do believe that corporates out there need to change the way that we manage and lead teams because it can't be done in that traditional, tactical, operational, strategic point of view. Um, and if there's one thing I will be rolling out next year is conscious leadership, that's for sure. Because we need to be more aware of what is actually happening in the surroundings. And I'm hoping that corporates actually embrace that right now, knowing COVID and what it's brought in, in, in the forefront for us. So. Well, I also think you spoke about consciousness in the workplace. Because I, I've had my own business and owned my own office, I'm now very privileged that I have a free office for myself and the foundation in a big corporate. So mm -hmm. I've taught my staff that if you see, and it's small little housekeeping things, and it mm -hmm. always happens late in the evening, if you're mm -hmm. leaving at 4 o'clock and you see there's no toilet paper, report it online because we've got a facility so they know that toilet x has no toilet paper if you mm. see that the light on the stairwell is out report it if you see that there's a leak in the basin but you know mm. people don't take responsibility for the environment no, so don't. until and and i get known as the winger and that's okay i feel that it's my job <laughs> as a manager to know those things but because, so i'm saying that it starts with if you don't notice your environment and accept your role in it, how will you be more conscious? We have yeah. to absolutely understand that. So for me, that's linked with throwing the cigarette stompy on the floor or the, the chips packet. So we are a very unconscious society and we need to absolutely. develop. So I think your program is much, much needed because it filters down from the fact yeah. that we can't and, even keep the toilets clean. Yep. Yeah. And, and you know what, Mara, it's, you know, for me, it's about, you know, how do we instill the change that we know that we need to make and the shift in culture, right? As much as we talk about traditions and how we grew up, it's how we growing up and how we, how we are conscious about, we relate back to our kids, whether it's bullying, what they're seeing. We are so unaware of what we are actually doing as a human being, as a human race, Mara. We are so, so oblivious to what we are actually doing with our behaviors. People do not see what they do. So from my side, you know, um, definitely early 2021 is something that I would be rolling out to corporates and to, and to bring that conscious awareness um, to leaders and, and to make sure that they understand what it means to be conscious about their surroundings, especially their staff and the people that they treat, how they treat 
and the sensitivity around that. So Mara, I want to just say, you know, thank you so much for, for this fantastic, you know, opportunity and sharing, you know, your story. Any last words or remarks from your side? Well, I want to share that I, I carry in my handbag a little spiral bound booklet and I take it everywhere with me and I write things in the booklet because one of the things about being observant or aware, as you say, is to be a person of your word. Yep. And we're all human and we're all so busy. So even last night when we stopped at the accident, I took my book out and I went up to the different people. Uh, we were able to help the young lady. And uh, I was actually, I'm, I want to share how blessed I was because I used my mobile number, my help service, and we called Namola. And within minutes, they were, the ambulance wow. was there. She didn't need an ambulance. But at the same time, I was going to call the police. The police came. And then other help services stopped. At one time, there were 12 people. And I just felt like... Um, it was a country of angels. I know that we live in a country where there's so many bad things, but she was surrounded by angels. Every person that was there, whether it was the police or the security guard for the area, wanted to help her. Even a young man who was a paramedic stopped to check her eyes and her, and her temperature. And I just thought, if only we could all contribute in that same yes. way to our country and be part of helping one another. So I took my little book out and I wrote everybody's name and phone number down. Now, I do that always. The people always laugh, say, Mara's going to get her book out. Because I forget. So if you say to someone, you know, I've read this fabulous book, and they say, you should read it. Well, well, I will let you borrow it. Write it in your book. Because otherwise your talk is worthless. And so yeah. I try to make whatever I say meaningful. If I tell you that um, I'm going to phone someone and give you an introduction, these are everyday small things that we do. You don't yeah. have to ask me twice. I'm going to phone that person and I'm going to send you an email. And I'm a very busy person. I might take three or four days, but I honor my word. So I guess my last word is, if you want to help survivors of rape and abuse and you want to be part of the new New South Africa after lockdown, make your word your bond. Do oh. what you say you'll do. Yep. Wise words from a wise woman. Totally agree with you, Mara. I want to say thank you so much for reaching out, coming on last week with the launch of um, the program 365 launch with AFBOB. I know you're doing some great work with AFBOB South Africa. So thank you so much for that. And just thank you for being such a great human being. You know, Thank you for saying that. I don't think of myself lack of that. I just think we've all got the same opportunity. No, I know. I know. And that's why I'm saying it to you. Thank you for being such a great human being and helping others and taking a story and a situation that you've had and turn it into something positive and light where you can help others. Um, people out there, sometimes there's always a story and that's what open mic's about. There's a story behind the story. And these type of stories is about inspiring others to come forward and share these amazing stories, whether it's heartfelt or doesn't matter, but it's those stories where it touches people and, and, and the beginning of something that can be created. Mara, I can tell you something, you know, I post these things on and, and people reach out and they'll tell me about these people that have touched their stories. It's amazing to hear people saying that this has touched them is, is something that I can tell I can truly say to you that it has for me. So I want to say to you, thank you for being such a special human being. My privilege. Thank you for sharing with me. Yeah. Thank you so much, Natasha, for joining as well. Um, Natasha says, I admire you, Mara. <laughs> oh, yay. Thank you. All right. Thank I'm... you so much. Have a great afternoon, Mara. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Yes. Cheers, viewers. Thank you so much for joining. And we will be back at 3, three o'clock this afternoon. Thanks, hey. Bye.